Dear God, we give you thanks and praise for our questions, our wonderments, and we bring them to your throne of grace, seeking um, answers and responses. And, um, and God, I pray that you'll help each person here hear exactly the word that they need to hear from you today, regardless of the words that come out of my mouth, and help me get out of the way so you can come and truly be the way, the truth, and the life, and the lives of those who are gathered here. In Jesus' name, we all agreed and said, amen. So today we continue with our seven key questions sermon series leading up to Easter. Um, Lent is a good season for reflection, um, but in the midst, Sundays are always little Easter's, and so we focus on, on Jesus as Lord, as resurrected in our lives. Um, and in the first week, we asked the question um, uh, that Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And we know that's the most important question we ever have to respond to in this life is discerning and determining who Jesus is to us. We looked last week at the question that someone asked Jesus, which is, what is the most important commandment? What is the greatest commandment that we need to follow? And it was to love God and love people. And today we're going to look at a question that, that all of us struggle with at one time or another um, in our lives along the journey. And that is, does God really accept me just as I am? With all my faults, my failures, my fears, my hurts, my habits, my hang-ups, or do I have to really actually get my act together first for God to want to be in a relationship with me, to truly love me? Does God really love the, the real, the raw, the unfiltered uh, Jamie, the me, the you, and every other person on this planet? Um, you know, we... We can turn to so many places in God's Word to take a look, and it says abundantly clear, it says that we are, in fact, accepted in God's love, just as we are. But that's so hard for us to grasp. That's really hard for us to get a handle on. Why? Because the journey from our head to our heart isn't actually 18 inches. Um, it's a lifetime, a lifetime journey of making sure that, that the good things from Scripture that we pour into our head finally makes it to our heart. And that's the difficult journey to travel. Psalm 139, verse 17, God says, it says, How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. Romans 5.1, Paul says, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God. Because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. That means we simply accept God's acceptance of us on the journey. Romans 8, 39, Paul said again, No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation, will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Or in 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul reminded us, he said, this is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. But still, we worry and we wonder if God is serious. Does God really, really accept me as I am? And I'm not only talking about this imagined, hoped for, better version of our future selves that one day will be after we follow Jesus for a lot longer. I'm talking about the moment, the second, wherever you are on the journey of faith. And we know everybody's in a different place on the journey. Everybody's somewhere, but everybody's on the journey. Still, what, what, what do we know? How do we understand this? Well, there's a great story in um, the Gospel of John in the eighth chapter. Um, and um, it's often referred to um, as the woman caught in adultery. But always know that this is a story about Jesus first and foremost. This is about his acceptance uh, of this woman and of everybody in the story along the way. So make no mistake, this is a Jesus story, and it's about the way that he accepts people like you and me just as we are. The Word of God for the people of God. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down, and he taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law, that is, the uh, scribes, we talked about the scribes last week, and, and last week was the only time that the scribes are mentioned uh, positively, when asked a question genuinely about uh, what the most important commandment was. Every other time in the New Testament, the scribes um, get negative press, okay? So it says the, the scribes... 
and the other religious officials, the Pharisees, brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. Now, we have utterly, absolutely no idea what he wrote in the sand, in the dirt in that moment. Some scholars uh, hypothesize that, that Jesus began to write down the sins of all the other people in the crowd and what they were guilty of. But the bottom line is he could have just been doodling because they didn't report. They didn't tell us what he said um, in, in this context. So he said, verse 7, they kept demanding an answer. <clears throat> so he stood again and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the midst, in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. So the scribes, you got to remember what the job of the scribe was, was not only to teach the religious law, but to make sure that the ancient manuscripts were handed down faithfully. Their job was to copy everything down perfectly from all the ancient texts of the Old Testament. So they had this really incredibly difficult job. Um, it had to be very precise, had to be meticulous in every detail when they were copying down um, new texts, because why? They were either right or they were wrong. There was no middle ground for them, and there was absolutely no room for error when they were copying down God's words for the people of God. Um, so what the scribes would do is constantly check one another's work to see how meticulous they'd been. And, and, and it's like they were always going through with a fine tooth comb and, and checking one another for mistakes and problems because this was going to matter for generations to come. This was really important work that they were doing. So when the scribes and the Pharisees bring this woman to Jesus, things are black and white. Things are cut and dry. There is no room for discussion about whether or not this woman is guilty or innocent. The woman knows she's guilty. The crowd knows she's guilty. The accusers who have brought her know she's guilty. Jesus is abundantly clear that this woman must be guilty of the sin that she's being accused of. Um, so when the scribes made a mistake, when they messed up a page, there was really nothing else to do but throw it away. And so in this case, they come seeking um, to throw this woman away. Because that's what, they're know, that's what they know. They go to their go-to strategy, and they just say, let's be done with her. In the second chapter of Mark's gospel, there's this great little story um, about a crowd of people who gather in a, in a homeowner's home, and, and uh, it's so packed in. There's so many people there. Lots of people have come to be healed by Jesus, and, and there's no way to get anybody else into the, the house at this point. And so some creative, thoughtful friends... Uh, bring their paralyzed friends up to the top of the roof, cut a hole in the roof. I don't think they checked that out with the homeowner. Um, but they cut a hole in the roof, they took some ropes, and they lowered him down on his pallet to Jesus. Why? Because they were doing whatever it took to get their friend into the presence of Jesus so that he could experience healing. And so then Jesus healed him. These accusers, they're doing everything that they possibly can to get this woman in front of Jesus but not for a good reason. They want her there as a pawn. They want her there simply as someone to use so that they can accuse Jesus of wrongdoing. They work hard. They take, do everything within their opportunity to get her there, but they want to push a death penalty. Here's the problem with that. Anytime someone brings somebody in the presence of Jesus in the New Testament and 2,000 years later, Jesus has a different goal. Jesus' goal is healing, health, and wholeness in the life of that person. Jesus' goal is salvation and more of deep relationship with him along the way. And so, so the, they think they've got this perfect trap, the scribes and the Pharisees, but they don't. Um, because Jesus is not simply going to allow this woman to be used as a pawn uh, of the accusers. 
And um, you see, uh, um, he doesn't see anyone as simply worthy of being thrown away. You see, if, if Jesus doesn't advocate that the woman be stoned to death, then uh, the opponents of Jesus are going to say, well, you're violating the law of Moses. And you're going against your own words, Jesus, because, because one of the things that you said is you didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Um, but to encourage stoning would have also ticked off the Roman government. Why? Because they had told the Jews, you no longer have the authority to stone your own people. If there's going to be any killing to do, we're going to do it. We're in charge now. You can't do that anymore. The other problem with this is, is on the other hand, if Jesus uh, let, just said, simply said, let her go, um, then he would be seen as being soft on sin and would also be violating his own teachings, which were hard on sin and gracious and loving towards sinners. Sinners were, were drawn and attracted to Jesus even though, even because of his, his holiness and his great love. Now, in the accuser's mind, um, Jesus is either an enemy of the law of Moses, uh, he's an enemy of holiness, he's an enemy of the Roman government, or he would be an enemy to all the people who had identified Jesus and locked on to him as someone who was a, a friend of sinners. And so he had a dilemma. They thought they had the perfect trap set for Jesus. One of the most... Um, Often quoted and least understood verses in Scripture, I believe, is Matthew 7, 1. Very important verse. It says, do not judge others, <clears throat> and you will not be judged. Now, the word that's used there for judge is krino. It's used about 114 times in the New Testament, and it is usually used in a positive way, and it means to sift, to discern, to make a choice. See why? We have to make choices we always have to make judgments about uh, what's right, what's moral, what, what are we going to do? And plenty of times in the Bible, um, it commends making the right judgment. But in this context, Jesus is talking about something different. He isn't condemning all moral assessments, or he's not denying that there are biblical standards. Rather, he's condemning, condemning judging other people in an ultimate sense. Um, see, it's not merely about maintaining biblical standards in this life. Um, when Jesus says, don't judge here, um, he's urging his followers to be careful, very careful, about making sure that they don't sit in the seat of ultimate judgment that God alone belongs in. Um, that that we, can't, we can't sit where God alone is, is to be. Um, so he's saying, don't do that. Um, don't say ultimate judgment in someone else's life is something that you can be in charge of. And the scribes and the Pharisees in John 8 seem all too happy to sit in the place where God alone belongs to determine ultimate judgment. And so in this moment, Jesus, Jesus turns the tables on the woman's accusers and leads them to see themselves as those who are actually accused of sin as well. In that moment when Jesus confronts them, uh, they remember all of the sins that they've ever committed, and they remember that, that it is only by the grace of God that they're not the ones standing in the woman's sandals with other people who carry stones to harm them. Um, and Jesus does them an incredible service in this moment to help them remember that they don't belong in the seat of judgment, ultimate judgment, that God alone has a right to sit in. Um, and so, so Jesus reveals his love for even those who have brought the stones to harm the woman. Um, Jesus loves those folks so much um, that he wanted to, to not leave them stuck in their spirit of ultimate judgment. And so they, they drop their stones and they, they leave one by one. Um, presumably it said that the, the oldest went first, perhaps because they were that much more aware of, of how deeply they'd missed the mark of God's full intention for their lives. Um, and, and the reality for us is, is we always need to be a stone-dropping people, a stone-dropping church. Better yet, uh, we need to be um, 
be a place, a church, a body of Christ that never picks up the stones in the first place because it's never our job to sit in the ultimate seat of God's judgment. Um, let me give you an example. Um, um, how many of you um, have any idea what the United Methodist Church's position is on gambling? How many of you think we're wildly in favor of it? Okay, we're not. We're not. Let me just say, let's be clear, but here's what, here's what, what our official statement on gambling is. It says, gambling is a menace to society. It is deadly to the best interests of morality, uh, social, of moral, social, economic, and spiritual life, and destructive of good government. As an act of faith and concern, Christians should abstain from gambling. Now, that's a pretty clear statement about gambling, isn't it? It says, gambling misses the mark of God's full intention for our life together as Christ followers. Now, as I look around the room, I'm pretty confident today that some of you put a dollar or two down on an NCAA bracket. Um, I, am, I am confident that, uh, that one or two of you has perhaps on one occasion or so purchased a lottery ticket um, or maybe, or maybe um, even stopped by the Hard Rock Cafe. Um, now, now, given that I am in general agreement with that statement um, of the United Methodist Church on gambling, how is it that I believe we are, we are called to treat people who, who uh, gamble or disagree with our statement? Do we condemn them ultimately? Do we throw stones of ultimate judgment at them? Do we say they're going to hell? Do we pick up our stones? No. We love them. We surround them with God's grace and love, and we accept them, and we keep doing it over and over again, because that's what Jesus does. One time, um, I uh, spotted a, a member of a church I was serving who was buying a, a lottery ticket, and his back was to me, so he couldn't see me in the store. And so it's like, you know, you don't ever, never know who's watching you, right? And so, so I come up behind him, and I lean in, and I say, hey, Don. Um, it takes 20% to clean up gambling winnings for the Lord's church. And uh, he just turned to me, and he smiled, and he said, oh, definitely 20% coming your way, preacher. Um, but, see, my, my point here is that we can have a standard. Jesus doesn't release us from high standards, but we hold them gently and generously in love, and that's what Jesus modeled with this very woman caught in adultery. But when we make its decision to put ourselves into the ultimate judgment seat and we play God, we forget that we're all under uh, Romans 3.23, where Paul says, says this profound statement, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, once once all the stones drop and the accusers all leave, Jesus turns to the woman and he says, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? And what she says next is interesting. By all rights, what she should have said was, no one teacher, no one rabbi. That's what the scribes and the Pharisees, they came to Jesus and said, teacher. But do you remember what the woman says? She says, no one Lord. She properly elevates Jesus to his role in the universe, and she identifies him for who he is, and she reveals that she sees Jesus clearly, and she's answering the who do you say that I am question from Jesus in exactly the right way. And she's now uh, experiencing a, a life change on the basis of a relationship that's given birth to in Jesus Christ. Um, she's saying, She's saying, I see you, Jesus, for who you are. I want what you're offering me, okay? Um, and the only one with the right to ultimately condemn this woman caught in adultery chose not to do it. Now, what Jesus didn't do was he, he didn't minimize her sin. He didn't say, hey, you know what? Adultery is no big deal. Don't worry about it. I know it's on one of the big 10 lists, but it's not that big a deal. Jesus didn't say that, but instead he invited her into relationship as she was, and he accepts her precisely in that moment as she was. Now, obviously, Jesus had read many times 
all those things that those, the, the scribes had copied so many times before from Deuteronomy and Leviticus that said that if you were found uh, guilty, if you were found guilty uh, of adultery, that you were to be stoned. And that was both the man and the woman, by the way. Not sure where the man is in this instance, but that's a whole other story. Um, but the reality is, is Jesus had read these and was abundantly clear about just what Scripture said. And instead, what he, he said in his mind was something different, that, that yes, it, it was more important to, to live out the spirit of that commandment in its fullness. I have come uh, not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So yes, I know literally what that command is, but, but there's a higher command. And Jesus has the right to do that. Why? Because he's Jesus, because of what he's about to do in the midst of, of his own life and death. I mean, he was able to do this because of who he was and where he was about to go. He was about to die on the cross for you, me, for this woman, for those accusers, for the crowd that he was teaching to that day. And the big question is, how can God be holy and just and still be gracious and loving? Because we declare that God is all of those things. Only by the cross of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he makes for you and me is that possible. Jesus takes my sins and, and he bears them, them up for me as he bled and died sacrificially as God's full expression for love. So when we look at the cross, that's what we see. We see the, the Father's full expression for love in, in allowing the, the Son to go to the cross in, in the midst of to save us. From ourselves. Um, now here's the thing. The woman, that woman didn't wake up one day and say, how can I mess up my life more fully? She didn't say, um, you know, how can I dishonor God today with my one and only life? Uh, no one does that. No one you know intentionally um, screws their life up like this woman does. And, and you didn't intentionally screw your life up at other times either. But perhaps at some point along the way, you did, and you know you did, and you know you need God, and that's good. If, if you don't think you're good enough for Jesus, you're right. That's the point. None of us are. But in his grace and in his love and in his mercy, he, he wraps his arms around us and says, I accept you precisely as you are now. Let's not stay that way. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. And you see, change always begins in relationship with Christ. Let's be clear about something. Um, this story isn't about the woman cleaning her life up um, so that uh, God will love her. No, that's not what it's about. Um, it's exactly the opposite of that. We, we don't change ourselves. We get in relationship with Jesus, and he changes us. As we, as we uh, try and train to be more like him over time, um, he's going to reveal more and more things to us that, that he wants us to turn over and do differently. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For God made Christ, who never sinned, um, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So Jesus doesn't condemn the woman. Instead, he takes her sin upon himself and offers her forgiveness, grace, new hope, and new life. And he does the same for us. One of the songs that we sing, sing a lot, I love one of the lines, and it says, all are equal at the foot of the cross. And that is so important for us to remember. Um, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody in the crowd that day listening to Jesus, wanting to seek him, the accusers who'd brought their stones, the scribes and the Pharisees, the woman, you and me, we're all equal at the foot of the cross. And this picture of how Jesus deals um, with this woman and with the accusers is a picture of how he deals with us in our sin and how he accepts us as we are and offers us new life. Um, Jesus invites some of us to be stone droppers. You know, get out of the seat that belongs to God alone. That's not your place to sit. But he says to others of us, go and sin no more. 
And why Jesus, Jesus accepts us as we are, even though he can't approve of every single one of our behaviors. Um, yes, the standards remain incredibly high, um, but Jesus can't bless our disobedience. He can't bless the disobedience of the woman caught in adultery. He can't bless the disobedience of, of the, the rock throwers who miss the mark of God's full intention as well in their judgmentalism. And he can't bless some of our disobedience either. But he loves us enough to tell us the truth about who we are. And then he reminds us that we belong to him. So the point of this story isn't to say that the, the commandments and breaking them are no big deal. Uh, the point of the story isn't to say that biblical standards don't matter. That's not the case. They do. They matter greatly. And it's really good when we as his followers can hold them gently and generously and in love and grace so that we can point people to the one um, who loves us so much that he accepts us just as we are and chooses not to leave us that way, that chooses to work with us and to grow us and, and says that time and time again, go and sin no more. Every time we get forgiven, picture Jesus saying, go and sin no more. Um, every time we receive grace, there is always a call to experience obedience in our life as well. Um, otherwise, it's cheap grace. Um, and it's a mess. Now, um, I want to close with a, another scripture. It's the next verse. It's John 8, 12. It's not really related to this story, but I think it's really important the way that, that John, as, as he was authoring this gospel <clears throat> led by the Holy Spirit, had this very verse to follow this story. <clears throat> John 8, 12 says, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. That's what he was trying to drive home to the accusers. That's what he was trying to drive home to the woman caught in adultery. And that's what he wanted the crowd who watched him teach that day to truly know and see Jesus Christ is the light of the world. When we seek him and follow him, um, he becomes our leader for life. And that's the good news of what it means to declare Jesus as Lord. Let's pray. Dear God, um, I thank you that, that you call us uh, to get out of the seat of ultimate judgment and that you call us to extend grace and mercy in the midst of, of the profoundly high standards that you set in the commandments and throughout Scripture. Help us be open and available to believing and knowing that we are sinners who've fallen short of your glory and stand in great need of your grace. Help us to extend that to others. Help us to, um, to point to the reality that, that Jesus Christ accepts everyone exactly as they are and works with us to become holy and filled with your Holy Spirit more completely all the time. We love you and thank you in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.